let us look at Hebrews chapter 7, verses 1 to 28. You'll be really pleased to know we have finally come to the moment of Melchizedek. <laughs> We've come to discuss this incredibly strange phrase in Hebrews 6 at the end, in verse 20, where it says, Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Well, who's Melchizedek? What Jedi order did he set up? Oh, come on. Now we got the Star Wars part, no? Okay, anyway. So we don't turn to the Gospel according to George Lucas. We turn actually only to two references, real two references of Melchizedek elsewhere in the Bible. That's in Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 to 20, and also in Psalm 110. Verse 4. So, before we dive into Hebrews, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 14. <coughs> Can you all see me alright? Yeah. That's alright. Because it is a bit dark in here. I don't know if the camera is actually going to pick up the... Sorry, let me turn this on for now because I can feel the camera's not going to... I know from... Being backlighting. Hi! <laughs> so, verse 14, 17 to 20 states this After Abraham returned from his victory over Kidor Loma and all his allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sh Shaveh, that is the king's valleys. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and a priest of God Most High brought Abraham some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abraham with this blessing. <coughs> Blessed be Abraham my, by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abraham, by the way, I'm saying Abraham, I'm not saying Abraham because it is Abraham at this moment. Then Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. That's it. <coughs> That's Melchizedek. Want me to reread that again? It's actually useful. After Abraham returned from his victory over Kedor Loma and all his allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shavi. That is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek the king of Salem and a priest of God Most High brought Abraham, sorry, Abraham, some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abraham with this blessing. Blessed be Abraham, my, by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abraham gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. <coughs> Excuse me. So, we're now going to look at the retelling of that in Hebrews 7, verses 1 to 3. This Melchizedek was king of the city of Salem, and also a priest of God Most High. Well, that matches what we've just read, doesn't it? Yeah? When Abraham, so by this point, he's now Abraham. Don't forget, Abraham had his name changed after a while by God to Abraham, meaning, you know... Um, father of nations. So, and don't forget, Abraham, for a Jewish person, he's the father of their nation. He's it. He's, he's it, all right? So, when Abraham was turning home from winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. Yeah? True? Good. Then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. Okay? Right, done. Then this makes... The name Melchizedek means king of justice and king of Salem means king of peace. What does that sound like? There is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. True? There was no mention of mummy and daddy, was there? And there was no mention of Melchizedek dying, was there? Just, okay? He remains a priest forever, resembling the Son of God. 
What's going on? Okay. First and foremost, notice everything's recounted virtually exactly, except for the bit that's missing is where Melchizedek brought Abraham bread and wine. Bread and wine, bread and wine, bread and wine. Anybody help me? Bread and wine. Any, any significant figure in our, in our faith about bread and wine? Anybody? Yeah. No, what's his name? Oh, Jesus. That's it. The Lord Jesus Christ. Yes? Okay. Hmm, interesting. And this is the point that the preacher is trying to make. He's talking to Jewish Christians. And he's trying to make it, get to the point of trying to explain that this Jesus is much more important than anybody else. And we'll unpack that as we go along. First and foremost, you must appreciate in the whole of Hebrews, I'm actually going to read a lot from here today because I want to get this right, okay? So it's quite a lot to take in cerebrally in your brain. <laughs> Firstly, we must appreciate that the argument here is spread over four chapters. We're not going to cover them all this morning. Smile. <laughs> But the ultimate reason is to prove that Jesus is the ultimate high priest. High priest being, he's the one who can arrange to go into the Holy of Holies. He's the one who can arrange to sacrifice for the sins of the people. Yeah, The ultimate high priest and better than anything else that the Jewish Christians have known in the past. These people are looking back at the Jewish past with all the temple practices of animal sacrifices and the popular interpretation of the law which is normally when we talk about law, Torah law, Old Testament law, like Ten Commandments and all the unpacking, that's normally with a big L. But here, you'll see, if you've got it in front of you, it's law with a small L later on. Small L really means it's their first century interpretation and what does that look like in real life. It's like us now, isn't it? You know, should we or shouldn't we drive cars? We don't know because it's not in the Bible, yeah? Or creation care. We understand we've got dominion over the earth, but what does that look like? Should we be reducing our plastic as Christians? Now, now that we know it's polluting the earth and it's getting into the food chain, so we're actually eating the stuff that we're polluting the earth with. And then we're wondering why we might be getting ill. Anyway, moving on. So this is what this means. So this is the small L of law, but they keep looking back at all and think, oh, we like the rules and regulations. We know where we stand with them. <coughs> and they're almost wanting to return back with a real strong <coughs> sense of nostalgia and we really are truly wondering about returning. It's interesting, isn't it? You can look back at your old life before you knew Jesus with a sort of sense of nostalgia if life gets difficult. Do you know it was easy when I didn't know Jesus? There's some Christians who think like that when the time gets hard. They think, oh, my sins don't get pointed out to me so easily when I didn't know Jesus, which is true. So they could be doing that. But the preacher here is now trying to show how obsolete the temple sacrifices and old life is now. Because they, and we, have a much better than much better life than that, knowing Jesus. Amen? Amen. And that Jesus, by the way, has always been God's plan. Hence why you've got Melchizedek here. The preacher's trying to show, look, we're going to look at this Melchizedek in the Old Testament to prove that Jesus has always ultimately been God's plan for, for redemption, for salvation, <coughs> for the earth. Okay? That's the point. Now, who's getting hot? No? Yes. Just okay. right. I'm baking. All right. So it's at this point you have to pretend now that you are a first century listener and interpreter. Can you try and do that? Yes. Try and pretend you're first century people? Because the style that the Hebrews preacher is going to use here is using a technique that to a 21st century ears that are really concerned with facts and figures can seem a bit odd. All right, so you're going to have to dump your understanding of how we understand history. Okay? Can you do that? Try and, try and sort of dump that to one side. In the first century, Melchizedek 
So the first century is Jesus' century. Okay, just sorry, just to put that into clarity. In the first century, Melchizedek had appeared in a lot of Jewish and Christian literature. This written version of Melchizedek was like a combination of the biblical man that we've just read in Genesis and the pop culture interpretation of him in the first century. So, like a film, for instance, would take a historical figure that we don't know too much about, but then create a storyline, an actable character, portraying elements of the old with a more popularised version. Films like about King Arthur, for instance. Do you know, with King Arthur, there is some really vague, written, verbal <coughs> folk law about him and it can be disputed that he even existed there really is I mean I know they make a big deal in Tin Tagel and places like that and Avalon and I'm not at all for one minute you know and it could be real but it can be disputed that he even existed yet this historical man that we really know nothing about <coughs> has been turned into countless books Movies, TV series that show him as some great virtuous king chosen by the pulling of a sword from a stone involving some woman laying down in a lake, yeah? <laughs> Who suddenly appears and goes, yes, and it's Excalibur, yeah? Round table down in Winchester. Remember going to see that in middle school? Came back with the biggest migraine I've never had one before. Because the top bunk bed that I had to sleep in with all my schoolmates, I had the skylight right over my head. Anyway, there you go. <coughs> Never been more happy to return to the loving arms of my mother and father. <laughs> I better say that now because mum's at the back. <laughs> all men are equal at the table. That is King Arthur. That's what we have. And then when you get to the BBC series of him, you've got Merlin. Well, yeah, Merlin anyway. But you've got Merlin now even more like a little boy. Oh, dragons. So you think, when you think about King Arthur, actually the historical thing we have of him, it's all been made up. It's been popularised, he's been generated as a character. And yet we hold this King Arthur up as a good example of a king. A good example of someone to follow. If you think about it, you sit there here in this country and listen to stuff. You will hold him up, you'll think about King Arthur, and there's normally this sort of says, oh yes, heroic. Oh yes, yeah? Did, does that? No? All the women go, yes, he was meant to be good looking. <laughs> Guinevere did not deserve him, because she goes off and has an affair with Lancelot. <laughs> yeah? But it's all of that that we generate. Yeah, the actual historical figure, we know about that much, if at all. Here is the same technique that is being used. So the preacher of Hebrews is taking those movie, char movie characteristics of Melchizedek, his good traits and interaction with Abraham that have been, <laughs> then the screenwriters and the directors have sort of grown the character and he's used this popular first century understanding to compare to the real Jesus. And we do that a lot sometimes. I know I've preached in the past and I know, looked at something like Luke Skywalker or, you know. You know, you've used an image of that stuff that we know to then help compare to what we really know about Jesus. And it's the same act. <coughs> so, what do we have here? According to the preacher in Hebrews, this is a clear foretaste of Jesus. A signposting to Jesus from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And we see that a lot now. After Jesus' death and resurrection, a lot of us now, we interpret the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus. So we actually see stuff in Jesus. And this is why then we get to Psalm 110, which I'll go to. Which is now the other weird place about order of Melchizedek. This is a psalm, 110, it's the psalm of David, and it's known as the messianic psalm. This is known as a psalm that is saying, actually this was about ultimately the Messiah of God, and this was therefore then about Jesus Christ. So, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honour at my right hand, until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. The Lord will extend your 
powerful kingdom from Jerusalem. You will rule over your enemies. When you go to war, your people will willingly serve you. You are arrayed in holy garments and your strength will be renewed each day like the morning dew. The Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. Do you remember last week about God's promise and oath can never be broken? Same thing. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord stands at your right hand to protect you. He will strike down many kings with his anger when his anger erupts. He will punish the nations and fill their lands with corpses. He will shatter heads over the whole earth. But he himself will be refreshed from brooks along the way. He will be victorious. That's a messianic psalm, by the way. It's the day of Jesus' return. Anyway. You are priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Okay, still confused? But you're with me so far about the interpretation route that the Hebrews author's going down. It's really important you capture that in when we go through the rest of this. So, so Melchizedek is king of Salem, which is? King of Jesus. Huh? King of Jesus. Yeah, but guess where Salem is? Jerusalem. Jerusalem, correct. And the priest of God most high. A bit later, uh, the author says that Melchizedek means just king of justice and king of Salem, meaning king of peace, which is what the author uses. But actually, this is a popular version of Melchizedek's name. But actually, his real name means my king is the Canaanite god Zedek. That's fascinating, isn't it? Yet the point is that Jesus is king of justice and king of peace. He is using the popular version of Melchizedek's name to say, well, you call this person king of justice and king of peace today, but Jesus is even more than that. Yeah? Okay. So, historical facts for both the preacher here in Hebrews and the hearers isn't particularly important for them. Actually, they're not worried about historical facts, even the hearers. That's why I said you've got to try and pretend you're a first century person. It's not that important. We are seeing this film character and we're using this character to help understand the importance of Jesus. So, verse 3, just to help unpack how he makes this even worse in his interpretation, well not worse, but in our ears it feels weird. In verse 3 of Hebrews 7 it says, There is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. And we went, yep, yeah. okay, there was no record. So then he, his conclusion is, he remains a priest forever. Now at this point we go, yeah, there was no record, you're right. But that doesn't mean anything. Surely his parents must have existed. He would have been born otherwise, would he, Melchizedek? And he must have died, mustn't he? Just because there's no record of it doesn't mean it didn't happen, did it? But the conclusion of Hebrews here is, no, he's still alive, he's timeless. He hasn't ended. He had nothing before, and he's had no ending. And we go, no, 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 that doesn't work. The Hebrews preacher is using a Jewish interpretation technique that was employed at the time, which states that what is not in the Torah, i.e. the Old Testament, or the first five books, what is not in the Torah is not in the world. Do you get it? Yes. So because there are no parents in the Torah, therefore they never existed, they weren't in the world. Because his death is not recorded in the Torah, he's still alive. <laughs> Therefore, this Melchizedek is actually resembling the Son of God because he is timeless. Okay? Okay. Therefore, this then helps this preacher start his debate and argument from verse 4. Consider then how great this Melchizedek was. Even Abraham the great patriarch of Israel recognised this by giving him a tenth of what he had taken in battle. So even the father of our nation recognised his greatness by giving a tenth of the plunder. And we know that we have to give a tenth of our plunder to the priests at the temple. 
Yeah? And the priests are called Levites, and they're descendants of Levi, who would have then come from Abraham. So we'll carry on the argument. I'm going to run now through this Hebrew argument and then just do some little quick sidelines, okay? So even Abraham, the great patriarch of Israel, recognized this by giving a tenth of what he had taken in battle. Now the law of Moses required that the priests, who are the descendants of Levi, must collect a tithe from the rest of the people of Israel, who are also descendants of Abraham. But Melchizedek, who was not a descendant of Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham. And Melchizedek placed a blessing upon Abraham, the one who had already received the promises of God. And without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. So, point being, you're a first Jewish person, Christian, you're finding being a Christian really hard because of the persecution, your family's trying to draw you back, and you're looking back nostalgically, maybe I can just go with me a few pigeons or me goats or whatever else, go back to the temple sacrifices, go and give me tenth back to the priests. That's what I'm meant to do. I remember the rules and regulations. Let me go back and do that. And what is going on here? Yeah, you're right. We are meant to give tenth to the priest. They're meant to come and collect their tenth from us. To worship God, to, for the temple, etc. Get that. But even now, Abraham had to give a tenth to this Melchizedek. This Melchizedek who's timeless, who is almost like the son of God. So if even our own father had to give his tent to this Melchizedek, doesn't that mean surely then actually Melchizedek's <laughs> bigger than Abraham, which then makes Abraham, that makes then this whole temple thing that we're doing worthless. Because Melchizedek's over this because he's not from the Levi. He's not he only became a priest, by the way, if he was born into the Levi tribe, yeah? You genetically have to be born and bred within the Levi tribe. It's the only way you became a priest. So, sorry, that's because my arm's aching <laughs> holding the Bible. <laughs> so therefore then, <coughs> and so therefore then, if this Melchizedek blessed our father of our nation, he's bigger than Abraham. Okay? It's like in some churches, you know, there are some churches that, you know, believe that you can only go to the Father for prayers and blessings and whatever else and forgiveness of sins, yeah? <laughs> we don't believe that in this church, you're alright. Yes. So, we go direct to the High Priest himself, Jesus. So it carries on, verse 8. The priests who collect tithes are men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than they are because we are told that he lives on. Again, we're not really told that. It's, but they are told that in the popular culture. By that time, it's all, oh, you know that Melchizedek geezer, he's still living on, isn't he? Yeah, it's the same sort of thing. It's like that King Arthur. He's still alive probably somewhere, he's dead and buried. But that sword, somewhere in the lake. In addition, we might even say that these Levites, the ones who collect the tithe, pay a tithe to Melchizedek, when their ancestor Abraham paid a tithe to him. For although Levi wasn't born yet, the seed from which he came was in Abraham's body when Melchizedek collected the tithe from him. So that's an interesting theological understanding, isn't it? Abraham, father of nations. Abraham, his descendants, as we all know, creates Levi. Yeah? So all the priests, all these priests that you're going to now, centuries later, giving their money, well, actually, they were in Abraham, being graphic, in his loins, as such. So actually, even these Levites were really giving 10% to this Melchizedek. Yeah? With the, the flow of argument so far. So if the priesthood of Levi, on which the law was based, could have achieved the perfection God intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood? When a priest in the order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Levi and Aaron. Don't forget, the author, the, the preacher here is trying to say, look, this whole temple worship thing's obsolete. It's gone. This priesthood stuff, gone. It's all gone. Forget it. I don't know why you keep looking at it with a sense of love and affection. 
It's obsolete. God wanted it to continue. He would have done. But Jesus wasn't born from the Levi tribe. Okay? And if the priesthood is changed, the law must also be changed to permit it. For the priest we are talking about belongs to a different tribe, whose members have never served at the altar as priests. What I, mean, what I mean is, our Lord came from the tribe of Judah, and Moses never mentioned priests coming from that tribe. Are you with the argument so far? Okay? Right, he's trying to go down the flow. Okay. Can you imagine, I read this over and over and over again. Then he carries on. This change has been made very clear since a different priest, who is like Melchizedek, like our movie character, has appeared. Jesus became a priest, not by meeting the physical requirement of belonging to the tribe of Levi, but the, by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. And the psalmist pointed this out when he prophesied, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And he is quoting from Psalm 110, which you would have beautifully seen up there if it was working. Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. Do you know that would have been a big deal for them to hear? All this temple stuff you've been doing for centuries and we as a nation have been doing, actually weak and useless. For the Lord never made anything perfect but now we have confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God. This new system was established with a solemn oath. Aaron's descendants became priests without such an oath. But there was an oath regarding Jesus. For God said to him, the Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. God. There were many priests under the old system, for death prevented them from remaining in office, yes? But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Amen. Right, okay, good. I can imagine right now the Hebrew church going, Amen! Amen! By the way, this, was just, this, this whole thing was just a sermon. It actually should never be read by you. It should be just listened to by your ear ball. So that's why I'm doing this. I'm doing what they would have done at the time. He is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honour in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sin. The law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness. But after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath. And his son has been made the perfect high priest forever. <laughs> so. The point that he's trying to make, this order of Melchizedek, is that Melchizedek in the Old Testament was both a high priest but was the priest, high pri priest of the Most High God, and he was also a king. Jesus is both the high priest forever and a king. And that's the point he's trying to get at. He's going to say, okay, so in our popular culture, we're holding up this Melchizedek like a King Arthur, yeah? And you're looking back at Melchizedek and thinking, well, Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And Abraham, therefore, then, is the father of our nation, so we should really be going back to Judaism. And he's saying, no, 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 you don't get this. Melchizedek wasn't even part of the Levi tribe. He's actually a complete random Gentile figure who appears, blesses our father, and you think he's great. But look at this Jesus, who, by the way, 
is truly is risen from the dead, truly is eternal, truly is the real high priest, truly gave himself up for sacrifices of sin, and truly is the king because he came from the tribe of Judah, where King David came from, who's the other great character that they all love. So don't be sitting there going, so our Jesus, he's actually in the order of Melchizedek in their understanding of who Melchizedek was. The popular version of him. That's what it means by this random quote in the order of Melchizedek. He's in the order of a priest and a king. Where the priests are just priests. The Levites are just priests. They're not and kings. Yet, yeah. our Jesus is both priest and king. So therefore he's able as a high priest to go into the holy sanctuary of God to intercede for our sins at every turn and also is to be Lord over all as king. So when I think about this today um, excuse me for the immensely long winded version but it was not going to be one that was going to be able to be um, unpacked in the space of about 10 minutes. The preacher here is combating for me a populist view, this made up view of Melchizedek, this romantic view of him and of Judaism, he's trying to stop, stop looking back at the past with a sense of rose tinted glasses if they had such things then. And it's like us today. I think there are things in our society that we look at with rose-tinted glasses and wonder, I wish I could do that as a Christian. You know, everything is permissible in our faith, just not everything is beneficial. And I think sometimes we try and follow things that we think are more pleasurable than following Jesus, or dare I say this, even better than Jesus. <coughs> but Jesus has made everything in life obsolete. And actually, when Jesus returned, ultimately everything we know now will not survive. It will be regenerated, renewed, and all that sort of thing. But the things that we try and get, possessions we take, things that we hang on to with precious dear sense of nostalgia and I'm not mocking having things and inherited things but if that becomes your idol you've just replaced Jesus with this idol and you're looking at someone with a sense of nostalgia but actually Jesus is better than all of that and we might all say amen but when we look at the other six, six and a half days of our week I do wonder if we really live it out In the West, it's very easy for us to want to, I don't know, there's lots of things I could think of. Settle down. <coughs> Nest, phrase I'm using. Oh, I find it because I'm getting older and a bit jointed, a bit creaker and can't hold the Bible anymore. You know, there's times you just think, I just want to go home and just recline back and go to sleep. But God might be asking us to do stuff. Let's remember our relationship with Jesus because he is the ultimate best relationship that we can have. No matter what our circumstances are, no matter what we're going through, he is both priest and king. You couldn't get anything better than that. Yeah, I do wonder sometimes <coughs> if we play with it a little bit. So, that's the order of Melchizedek. Did you understand it? Yes. If you didn't, Welcome to my club. <laughs> if you didn't, come and see me. Because it is quite... It's more for group discussions, I think. Um, because it is quite an in-depth thing. It's when you look at... Um, you've got to think about how they think. And a bit later on, you'll notice we do, this, we do do the same in King Arthur movies. I was thinking about Thor, but then I thought, no, he's not a real character. He's, he's a Norse god, so we won't use him. And then I was sitting there and I was saying, and I'd already read about King Arthur, and you know when you get those great moments with God, and you think God's going to confirm something to you? 
So there I am talking to Joy, and I said, oh, I'm thinking she might like King Arthur. And I went, yeah. <laughs> can't be saying anything. So the point being, that we, we worship an everlasting God, yes? yes? An eternal God. And I do wonder if sometimes we, I don't know, do you, do you forget that at times? Do you not quite live that out when trouble comes, or even just when the good times hit? We forget who is our eternal God. And the fact that he is eternal. And that we can always go to him no matter what. Bible study group this week, somebody actually turned around and said, do you know something, what is our problem? We go to every other avenue first, before we eventually realise that we should go to God. <coughs> and it's the same with these people here. They were going back to Judah to think, actually that's the better route. And he's going, no he's not! Jesus is the only route. So, let's spend some time worshipping, reflecting, and um, we're going to sing Everlasting God. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.